Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. Father God, we thank you and we praise you for tonight. <coughs> Fathers, we come before you. We come before you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord God, as we come to the conclusion of this day, Lord God. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you'll open up our ears, our hearts, Lord God, to just readily receive your word. And that word will be planted on good and fertile ground. We thank you, Lord, that what we receive, Lord God, will not only be beneficial for us, but we'll be able to share it with others and be a blessing to others. Father, we pray, Lord God, over our homes, over our children, Lord God. We thank you for divine safety, Lord God. We pray over our, our siblings, Lord God, our parents, Lord God. We lift them up, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord God. That, Father, we live in a country, Lord God, that we can freely praise you and worship you, Lord God. Father, we just thank you. We praise you. We lift up those that are watching over Facebook, YouTube, Lord God. Just bless their homes, Lord God. Let them hear clearly. Let them receive an accurate word. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name, and we do agree by saying, Amen. Okay, as you know, we have started. We've been teaching on prayer. We're still on prayer, but last week we started looking at the Lord's Prayer, okay? Um, our foundational scripture is found in Luke uh, 11 and 1. And let me flip over there real quick. <laughs> and it reads, And it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. As I said last week, prayer is a learned activity. You know, we, we, we know how to pray. As we mature, we, we learn different elements of prayer, okay? Now, we want to look at this um, in an aspect as when people taught us about the Lord's prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, when they taught us that, they taught us that that was the Lord's Prayer. Okay, that's exactly the way most of us were taught that that was the Lord's Prayer. As I shared in my own experience, I prayed that prayer from a kid till I was grown because I didn't know no other prayer. I, was, I didn't grow up in a church, okay? And, and I took it as being the Lord's Prayer, okay? But now if you turn over to Matthew chapter 6, we want to look at something. And that's 6 and 9. Well, what I want to do while you're turning there, I'm going to start reading at Matthew 6 and 5. It says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you... When you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your heavenly Father, who is who is in who is in the secret place, all right. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly, all right. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they they will be heard for their many words. And what is he saying? He says, just because you got a long prayer, don't mean that you're gonna be heard, okay. Um, then he says in 8, Therefore do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask. Now notice that he says he knows what you have need of before you ask. So you can get straight to the point. All right, you can get straight to the point. Now we come into verse 9, and this is where I want you to pay close attention. It says, In this manner, therefore pray. Some Bibles may say, In this fashion. Some may say, do anyone have any, any this is, all right. This is how you should pray. All right, it says, in one Bible we have here, it says, this is how you should pray. Understand, it says, this, pray in this manner, all right, or this is how you should pray. So what Jesus is about to do, he's about to give them an example of prayer. He didn't say, this was the prayer, all right, because if this was the prayer, why are we praying any other prayers? Huh? If this was the prayer, 
If this was the prayer, this would be the only prayer that we need to look at. Last week, we, we looked at our Father, which is in heaven. I told you last week, I'm going to go a quick update. Your relationship has a lot to do how you approach the Father. You know, if we base what we know off of fatherhood in this world, then we can also look at God as being that type of father. Abusive, neglective. You see what I'm saying? So you have to re you have to rethink how you look at God as a father. Okay? You know, because if you didn't have a father that was really there, if you had issues with your father, when we start talking about our father, you're going to find yourself relating that to God. And that's that's why we have certain challenges to come to God in a relaxed mode. Okay? See, because when you have a good relationship with your father, you're able to go to him and just kick it with him. Just talk with him. Okay? Then we came and we looked at <clears throat> Hallow Be Your Name. And we talked about his name is to be set apart from everything else. We have a lot of people that, you know, want to say that they're God. All right? But God's name has been set aside just for him. So when Jesus said, hallowed be thy name, he was saying, your name is above every name. Your name is separated from every other name. And God himself is the only one worthy to be called by that name. Okay? So now, we come to your kingdom come and your will be done. All right? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, this is why in my understanding that I really do believe that this is a model prayer. Because look at it. It says, your kingdom come, all right? Your kingdom come, let me get to the right place here, and your will be done. Now, the kingdom of God is the rule of an eternal sovereign God of all the universe. See, when we say your kingdom, we're talking about his rule. All right? He says his kingdom, his rule come. All right? But we find in Matthew 3, 1 and 2, it says in those days. Now watch this. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And what did he say? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now he tells them to repent that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So if it's at hand that means it's near. Right? Okay. In Matthew 4.17 this is Jesus. From that time Jesus began to preach and say repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we find John the Baptist saying it. We find Jesus saying it. Now this is where I want you to really look and listen to this. Luke 17, 20 and 21. And when he was demanded, talking about Jesus, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom should come. Now they jamming Jesus up wanting to know when the kingdom's going, when is the kingdom going to come? When is the kingdom? Because see, in their mind, they were looking for someone to ride in on a horse. Yes. To take over with armies. All right? They, that's what they were looking for. They were expecting when they, you know, their king, they were expecting a king to come physically in what they had been used to. So, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. He said, it doesn't come from what you see. Neither shall they say, lo, here's the kingdom, or lo, there's the kingdom. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Okay? So if the kingdom of God is in you, that means that the sovereign rule of the universe resides in you. So now, if the kingdom of God is in you, why would you pray for the kingdom to come? Doesn't make sense. Not if it's in you. 
Because in our mindset, we think the kingdom is heaven. We're waiting for it to come. It's well, see, knowledgeable in the Bible. Well, see, I can understand what you're saying and the question for those that's on Facebook that sometimes we could think to pray for heaven to come. But if God has created us in his image because of his shed blood we have redemption and now we have right standing with God. Okay? He fills you with his Holy Spirit the kingdom is here. So when revelation happens, when everything is done, heaven is on earth. Yeah, it ends up, it comes back. We, we will end up living here on earth when it's all over, yes. But see, listen to what Jesus said. Listen to what John the Baptist said. He, they both said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why was it at hand? Because Jesus was here. The rule of God was right there in Jesus. All right? So they were saying it's at hand. When Jesus was resurrected and we were now able to be filled with the Spirit, we have the kingdom in us because what God wanted to do through us is bring the kingdom here on earth through us, our actions. You see what I'm saying? Because we are the ones that should be taking authority over the devil. We are the ones that should be walking in authority. You see what I'm saying? Because, see, we are not fighting for victory. We're fighting from a place of victory. Do you see what I'm saying? See, we're maintaining what has already been done. So the kingdom is in you. So, see, this is why I say this has to be a model prayer. All right? See, the better, see, see, the better translation would be the kingdom of God is in your midst or among you. See? See, in um, uh, Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2, Matthew 4 and 17, where it says the kingdom of God is near you, the correct translation is it should either be among you or in the midst of you. See, now if you read it like that, now watch this. In those days, John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is among you. The kingdom of heaven is in the midst of you. Now automatically, if somebody says that, you start to look around because you're looking for who's in the midst of you. He was referring to Jesus just as Jesus said that the kingdom repent for the kingdom of hand is among you. The kingdom of hand the kingdom of God is amidst you. Alright? But then as time went on, he told, his, he told the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is within you. It's, in, it's within those that have accepted him, all right, as ruler. Those that have accepted him as savior. It's inside of you. You have the authority. See, just like Jesus spoke to the wind, Amen. you have the authority to do the same thing. That's right. It's just the fact that, you know, see, Jesus knew who he was. He knew who his father was. So when he prayed or requested something, he knew he was going to get it. Our problem is that when we ask for something, we wonder if we're going to get it. We don't really say it with authority. We said, well, uh, um, oh, um. see, you got to say it in the name of Jesus. You know, you got to say it in the name of Jesus. You know, devil come out of that person. You got to know that when you lay hands on someone, you have the authority over sickness and disease. That's right. See, sickness and disease don't have a choice. Let's go back to the, let's go back to the storm. Jesus stands up and 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 he and it says he rebuked the winds and the waves. The wind and the waves didn't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> See, they didn't have a choice. They didn't, they didn't they couldn't think about it. See what I'm saying? See you have to understand that when you speak in the name of Jesus, whatever you're speaking to doesn't have a choice. Doesn't have a choice in the matter. Because it's already been settled. That's why he says his word will never return to him void. Why? It's because his word is the most powerful thing that is in existence. And that's Jesus. See, so we have to retrain our minds of how we think when we pray. 
We have to retrain our minds of how we think when we cast out demons. We have to retrain our minds when we lay hands on the sick. Yes. You just, it feels good to hear the way you're saying it because now I understand when I pray, 90% I'm self-doubt in that prayer. But there was only that, that, that I can remember that one time when I prayed for, for my friend's father to open his eyes and I felt it like, I was like, you see, like, authority. Let, me, like I felt let me show you let me show you something I was just thinking about something when you said this you got two official officers the other one is a security guard <laughs> all right and you're coming down the street and the security guard stands up there and says slow down slow down you know half the people don't even pay no attention right that's true even though he has authority, but he doesn't have the authority as the policeman has. Now that same policeman is at the next corner where the car just went past the security guard and he stands up there and says, stop. Look, car freezes. See, the difference is the security guard wasn't sure of who's really behind him. The policeman knows that he has every piece of authority behind him you have to know that when you speak or when you pray you have all of heaven behind you Amen. see you have to know that you have all heaven and see what the devil does he wants to make you doubt he wants to make you not sure of yourself he wants to make you feel that you you shouldn't deserve it well why would God tell you to ask if he wasn't going to give it to you that's a cold piece of work. You know, if you were standing somewhere and, and you seen a parent talking to their kid and they had a piece of chocolate and they said, Honey, baby, you want a piece of chocolate? Just ask me for it. And the little baby said, Mama, give me some chocolate. And they started laughing and ate it up. <laughs> you would look at that person and say, My God, how mean, how cruel, wouldn't you? But why do you think God's going to ask you to, why do you think God's going to ask you to ask him to pray and not, not give it to you? It's because the relationships that we have had with other people, so many broken promises, so many disappointments, and we don't see him as we should, those things can interfere with our prayer life. No, because, see, the love that we have gotten in throughout our lives has not been the type that God wants to give us. It's what we have been all looking for. Now that God wants to offer it, we can't recognize it because of all the abuse, the mishaps that we've been through. Okay? But God wants to reintroduce you to himself. Do you understand what I'm saying? The reason that we have those challenges is because, first, we don't want to get to know God as we should. See, you can't trust somebody you don't know. You really can't. So you have to spend time with him. You have to spend time. And, and when I say spend time, it doesn't mean that you're praying for five, six hours. For those of you that do, you can continue on. But I'm saying, it's not necessary. You know, because there was one time in my life that I prayed like that, three and four hours. All right? But I don't pray like that now. Like I did then, that was every day. I don't now, not saying that it's, it's anything wrong with it. It's not. You know? But for me right now, I don't believe that's what God has me doing. Okay? Now, there are times when I would get into intensive prayer, but that's not on a regular basis. Because what we can end up doing, you can make your prayer life so religious that now you you looking at the clock. You, and you're not enjoying prayer. You're not enjoying it. Why? Because now it's just like you're going to work. Do you see what I'm saying? See, so when the Bible tells us pray without ceasing, what it's saying is always be in a communication mode with the Father. Because what is prayer? Prayer is no more than talking to God. So if I, if it says pray without ceasing, I can put it another way. Talk to God without ceasing. You see what I'm saying? So we have to we have to start understanding what prayer is and how prayer works for us. 
So when he says here, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, okay, we must understand that the kingdom of God is in you, okay? So what we should be praying now is for the manifestation of the kingdom. For the manifestation of the kingdom, in the, that we see the manifestation of the kingdom, okay? See, there are three, there, 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 there are three things I want to look at in uh, Luke 17, 21, where it says, the kingdom of God is within you. One is, the kingdom of God is essentially inward, within man's heart. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. The kingdom of God is within your reach, if you make the right choices. What do I mean by making the right choices? You know, doing the things that God says to do, okay? And if you make a mistake, if you make a mistake, ask God to forgive you and keep it pushing. Don't get so far out there that you run from the church. That's stupid. If you, if you wound it, you run to the hospital. You don't run away from the hospital. So if you're going through something, the church is where you need to be. And that's why this coming Sunday, I'm starting to teach on what the church actually is. Not a concept, but what it is from the scripture. Because unless we come to understand what the church is, we'll always think of the church as just a building. Okay? You know, and I understand that I've heard people say, I am, I am the church. You know, okay, in a sense that's correct. But there's three. You have the universal church, which is a worldwide church. You have, you have the uh, uh, local church, is what we have here. Then you have you as the individual church. So if you really want to know how it goes, people, it goes that the individual church should be connected to a local church, and the local church should be connected to the universal church. You know, because see, not only is the church a group, okay, it also is the body of Christ. So that's like, you know, you got different parts on your body. We'll get into that Sunday. Let's keep moving. All right. The kingdom of God is in your midst. In the person and the presence of Jesus. All right. See, so we have to understand the kingdom. Then it talks about God's will. See, God's will can be referred to as his perfect plan for you. Because, see, God's will for you may not be God's will for her. Do you understand? So, so God's will is the perfect plan, all right, for you. And you'll never know God's will unless you know his word. That's why when people say, well, I don't know what the will of God is. Most of those that say that are people that don't know what the word of God is. Okay? See, so if we spend time... In the word, trust me, you're going to know the will of God for any situation. Okay? See, sometimes we want to wait for God to speak out of a cloud when we, you should pick up your Bible and let him speak to you through here. Amen. See? See, because see, God speaks in different ways. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so we, we have to understand that the Bible is something that we need to get into because if we love God, we should love his word. Amen. Okay. When we pray for his will, we should be praying for God's agenda, not ours. Mm. See, we need to see God's program, his agenda. See, he will always give you what you need. See, he will always do that. Because he's your, he's your supplier. He's your source. He's your provision. He is this. He'll give you what, he, what, what you need. Okay? But you have to understand that the scripture says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added unto you. And that's Matthew 6.33. But if you go back to like 20... Here, 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 here. Let me... I'm already there. Let me just go over here. Because, look. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, things, material things, shall be added to you. 
what things. People read this, but very few go to search out what the things are. So let's see what the things are. All right. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. I'm starting at 25. What you, what, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. But your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more? Are you, are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to your statue? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 39. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? After all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Okay? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto, unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Right there, he's, he, he's telling you, if you put me first, I'm going to see the, all these other needs. That's a promise. But a lot of times, we don't put him first. You know, we don't put him first until we are absolutely in trouble. See, until we already out of gas on the freeway. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. You know, see, so if we do, and when we pray this, your will, see, when we say the kingdom of God and the will of God come, well, why don't you pray for his will in your life? Why don't you say, Lord, what is your will for my life? Show me. Why don't you ask him? What is it you want? Okay? Because sometimes we can be wanting something that's not in line with what God wants for you. But see, we, you know, we, 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 get, we, we see something, we want something, and we get stuck on something, and we forget about God. So when we pray, we should pray God's agenda for our life. Okay? It's amazing how many of us read, you know, quote that scripture. For I know the plans I have for you over in Jeremiah. Notice, this is what God says. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Notice this. So many people quote that, but they forget. God says, I know the plans I have for you, not the plans you're going to give me. You see what I'm saying? See, this is where we have to stop and think about how we need to rethink our thinking. How we need to reposition ourselves with God. Okay? Okay. Now we want to move on to number four. Give us this day our daily bread. We need to depend on God for everything. For everything. Okay, we really do. But see what has happened to a great deal of us. And this is what happened. And I mean, this has happened to everyone. Okay? There are so many things that we become so independent on. that we feel we can do this. We don't want to put a burden on God. God is a big God. He can handle it. He can handle it. Well, I don't need to, you know, I don't want to ask him about, you know, to, to direct me to a sale at the market. Why not? Why not? Why not pray for a parking place before you leave home? I sure do. Huh? Why not pray 
that today as I go to work, I'm going to meet somebody I can share the word with, share some love with. You know, I'm not saying that you were praying to preach, but just to be kind and show love. Okay? So we need to depend on him. See, Psalms 121, it says, I will look to the hills from where cometh my help. Now, let's, let, now what does that mean? If I look to the hills, I have to what? Look up. So in other words, I'm going to look up because that's where my help comes from. What is help? Help is assistance. Okay? We depend on many things. We depend on food. We depend on water. We depend on air. You know, we depend on a properly functioning body. We depend on these things because they are what? Essential. They're important. Well, you should depend on God just as much. You should depend on God just as much. See, just as much as you depend on breathing air, you should wake up in the morning with that dependency on God. See, ask God for what you want and need. Then trust him for the answer. Trust him for the answer. Well, Pastor, I have asked him and I haven't seen anything. Keep waiting. Keep thanking God. See, keep that. See, there is, there is, there is something that we have to understand. It is a difference between believing and faith. Okay, there is a difference. They're two different words. They have, they, they mean two different things. And most of us, we remain in a place of believing, but we never move over into a place of faith. See, believing is accepting something as being true, okay? It's accepting something as being true. Faith is moving on what you have accepted. Now what am I saying? If we're going to move in faith and we pray for healing on our body, all right? We pray for healing on our body. When we finish praying that, we should say, thank you, Lord, if we believe that it has happened. We don't believe it because we see it. We believe it because he said it. Okay? See? And the next day you wake up, you still got a pain, but you're still saying, thank you, Lord, for my healing. See? Because, see, if you believe, now, see, that's acting on your faith. Do you understand? That's acting on what you believe. Do you You See, if you believe, and that's all you do, the devil can really mess with what you believe. You see... How is that? Well, two days went by and you still don't feel no better. Mmm. That stuff over there don't work. It worked for Miss Babel, Miss Mabel down the street, but it ain't gonna work for you. See, we start to accept that because we don't see a manifestation of it immediately. Do you understand what I'm saying? See. But see, we have no problem when the doctor gives us six weeks of medicine. Mm -hmm. And we don't feel nothing for the first week, the second week, but we're still taking the medicine three and four times a day. And then you, you may have a doctor's appointment in between there. And when you go to the doctor, he said, how you doing? Well, doc, I still got, you know, I still, I still feel the same way. And what did he tell you? Well, keep taking the medicine. And then you leave out of there and go do it. See, if we can have the faith in that medical physician, how come we can't have that like that with God? Okay? Now, I'm going to go to the doctor and get my medication, but I'm going to pray over my body. Huh. Because, see, some of us, our faith may not be there to get an instantaneous healing. That medication may help while your faith is being built to receive your healing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. So for somebody listening to me, I am not telling you to stop taking your medication because you might be end up D-E-A-D -E dead. Keep taking it until your faith grow. Keep taking it. Okay? See, so we have to we have to understand that just because you haven't seen your deliverance and you still drinking, alright? And you, 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 you praying for deliverance. That don't mean that you ain't delivered. Wait for the manifestation of it. 
Just start with the bottle in your hand. Lord, thank you for my deliverance. I'm delivered in the name of Jesus. I'm delivered in the name of Jesus. Because even though you have, you're still drinking, you're still confessing that I believe God has delivered me from this. Amen. And one day you're going to go to get it and you'll say, I'm cool. I'm cool. See, that's acting on faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. See, but what happens is, is because you, you, somebody prays over you, or you pray for your own deliverance, and you go a day, two days, and then you blow it, you get into this guilt trip. Oh, I let God down. God knew that you was going to trip out on the second day before you did. He knew it before you did. Do you understand what I'm saying? But see, that'll stop you from saying, Lord, thank you for my deliverance. Because now you move it in a place of shame and a place of guilt. Mm -hmm. See, you got to say, Lord, thank you for my deliverance. I'm not concerned how I look. I'm just concerned with what you said. See, I'm concerned with what you said. You are my deliverer. See, you got to stand up. See, we got to stop being spineless Christians. See, wasn't it amazing how, man, when we was in the street, man, we throw down. I mean, fight a minute. Fight in a minute about nothing. Uh, what you say? But then when it comes now, we can become so passive that we don't want to fight the enemy. You're going to have to stand up open your mouth for the enemy. You're going to say, man, I'm healed in the name of Jesus. I've been promised long life. Yeah. You got to stand up and you got, you got to speak it and say it like you really mean it. You remember, oh, come on. I, I'm, 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 I'm just going to talk about me. A couple of y'all out there. You understand me? How you acted when you was in that thug life? What? What you say? You gonna have to act the same way with the devil. What you say, devil? Oh no, that ain't popping off. That ain't jumping right now. Not with me, because I know what my father said. But again, it comes back. What kind of relationship do you have with the father? Huh? What kind of relationship do you have with him? See, you got to know that God will roll on your behalf. You got to know that. You got to know that God will roll on your behalf. See, when you know that, you understand me? You, hey, you know your backup. So, Psalm 62, 5, 8 reads like this. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. People, the Bible teaches us that we are to become boldly before him. The throne of grace. What does that mean? We find that we can see a good example of that as I shared briefly last week with the prodigal son and his return home. He knew that home was better than where he was. And he says, even if my father was to make me one of the, the slaves or the helpers at home, it's still better at his house than at what I've been through. You see, but we, we talk so much about the prodigal son over in Luke 15 that we forget, to, we forget to examine the love of the father. Could you, somebody cut that fan, those fans on? Hey, just one of those switches back there. See, and we forget, we forget, we forget that. See, the love of the father was... Yes, son, you, 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 you did mess up. Yes, son, I love you in spite of, okay? See, we have to understand. See, that's why I'm telling you when Jesus says, start out our father, he wants you to come before God knowing that, you know what? Lord, you knew I was going to mess up before I messed up. You know everything about my life. You know everything about my life, everything that I've done, and you know everything I'm going to do. But yet and still, Lord, you've given me permission to come to you. And I can come to you because I know you love me. I know you care for me. 
in the times when I don't have energy, Lord God. You know when I don't have strength. You know when I don't have energy. You know when I'm hurting, Lord. So I can come to you, Lord, and I don't have to say anything. I can just lay here and cry. Because you already know, Lord God, what's in my heart. Lord, when I'm wounded, Lord God, you are my Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God that healeth. Yes. So many of us, we bleed internally. And while we're bleeding internally, we have learned to smile. But God knows the pain that you're hurting. It's no shame to tell somebody, hey, I don't feel it today. I love God just as much as I did yesterday, but I don't feel it today. And I'm waiting for him to make a change in me on how I'm going to move. See, it's okay. You ain't, got to, you ain't got to go on pretense and always act like you know you super Christian. You understand me? Hey, you ain't never, you, ain't, you know, the only thing missing is a cape. You know? No. You know what? We all hurt. We all go through things. We all want to cry. We all feel disappointed. All right? We all make mistakes. That's just life. Okay? And God knows that. God knows that. Do you not think that while Jesus was walking this earth, that he seen many people that had made mistakes? He talked to a lot of them. All right, let's talk about the woman at the well. See, when he, when he talked to the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, if you go back and you read the story, he told his disciples, I have a need to go through Samaria. I have a need to go through Samaria. And see, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along. That's a whole other story. You can go back, I believe it's in 1 Kings, and you can find out what happened. But they were Jews too. They were Jews, and they were still Jews. But what the, what the problem was, they had a big difference. So when he said he had a need to go through Samaria, I'm quite sure that the disciples probably said, what do you mean you're going through Samaria, man? Well, why do you want to go through Samaria? But they're not going to question Jesus. So then they go off to get some food. Jesus sits and here comes a woman. A Samaritan woman. Okay? He had a need to go through Samaria. He had a need to go through Samaria. His need was to be where that woman was going to be. To free her from her past. To free her from her pain. To free her from her disappointment. See, that's the God that we serve. That's the God that we serve, that will free you, love you, care for you, talk to you. See, that's the God that we serve. So when we come to him and say, our father, we got to know that, man, he wants to listen. He's concerned. He's concerned. If we can get that, if we can get that much, then we can really have a conversation with God. We can really have a good conversation when we know that he's not like our earthly father. Amen. Okay? You may have had a good earthly father. So you can have a good relationship with God from what you've had with your earthly father. But the majority of us have not. So we have to start all over again. And God understands that. And he's willing to do that. He's willing to do that. He's going to be there for you when, he, when you need him. So, see, problems force us to look to God and depend on him instead of ourselves. A lot of times, we'll go through things. <laughs> Not that God brought the things on us, but God will let us go through. So you can get up off, like, 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 like my parents used to say, so you can get off your high horse. So you can get off your high horse. All right? Because, see, when you're on your back, the only place you can look is up. Yeah, that's true. See, and it's bad that we have to get to that point, but sometimes we can get so, so arrogant, so haunty, so self-centered, so selfish, so, so prideful that something has to come into our life to remind us that you're not God. See, you can become your own idol. <laughs> See, so sometimes things will happen in your life. Those things that happen in your life probably could be the best thing that ever happened to you. Because it puts your focus back on God. See, I've been trying to learn how to, you know, really get my photography together. And 
I was working with one of my lenses the other day, and I was trying to snap, but it wouldn't snap. It kept focusing. It kept, you know, it kept going in and out, you know, but it wouldn't click on me. It was automatic. I had it. But then as soon as I ch changed it to manual, all right, and I got what I needed in sight, it was blurry, but I was able to adjust it till it focused. See, sometimes what we have done in life, we have let God get out of focus. He's there. We can make out the figure, but he's out of focus. And we got to slow down to allow God to be back in focus. Amen? Amen. Okay. <laughs> Forgive us our debts, which is our sins, as we forgive others their debts. I mean, come on. You ask God to forgive you, but then you have a hard time forgiving somebody else. Oh, but I'm going to get better than that. You ask God to forgive you, and then you can't forgive yourself. I'm going to give me a drink of some juice on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, listen, I'm not advertising snap on you. <laughs> okay. See, You've got to know that if you want God's forgiveness, you're going to have to learn how to give forgiveness to other people. I understand that people, you know, some of them have probably did some really, really horrible, horrible things. You know, and you're probably sitting there saying, how can I forgive that individual? Because you have no choice as a Christian. That's why I can tell you that. You have no choice. You know, God didn't put that up for grabs or questions. He says, as I have forgiven you, you forgive others. Okay? See, and all the stuff that you've done in your life against God, oh my God. And he still says, I forgive you. See, but the issue is, your biggest problem is you can't forgive yourself. So really what you're saying when you can't forgive yourself you're really saying that God is not as big as your problem. That's really what you're saying. Yeah, I have a question back here. I have a question. The day of women of Manna, they gave us a list uh, to forgive people. Mm -hmm. The first person I put on the list is the person that tried to kill me. Okay. And in 97, that same day, that same day that I wrote his name mm -hmm. for the first time ever, that night, I saw him face to face. And till this day, I do forgive him. Because I felt like God, like not in a bad way, I felt like God was like testing me. Like, this is it. Like, he's in your face now. Do you truly forgive him? And I did. I, I forgave him. I, you know, I, I had to. Right, right, but right. Okay. Weird. The, the, when you come like, face to God, face. Yeah, like, why did God do that? Like, but, see, sometimes... That was like, Sometimes God will allow something like that, that you meet somebody that's really hurt you, really done something to you face to face, to show you either you have really forgiven them or you haven't. See, because, see, a lot of times we say we have forgiven someone and we'll be in, we'll be in the mall or somewhere and we'll see them coming and the first thing that goes through your mind is what you want to do to them. So you really haven't forgiven them in heart. You've forgiven them in words. And when that happens, you need to say, Lord, look, I'm having trouble forgiving this person. So I need your help. So, Lord, I'm going to pray for this person every day until this is released from me. Okay? See, and I, and I know what has happened is bad. I know it is, it is, it is not comfortable. I understand that. But... Unforgiveness only traps you. Yes, it yes. does. And that's why I forgave. Like when he was in my face, like see, like I had my daughters with me, so I felt automatically I have to because it's time for me to forgive. And I have my children. I don't want my children to hold on to anything that I have. And see, that's where you have to know Maturity. that look, you know, I'm not look, look, I'm not trying to downplay anything that someone has done. Right. All right. See, what you may feel is a, uh, is, is, is a uh, catastrophe, it may be fine with you. 
So one person, you can't look at one person and say, you ain't got over that yet. You know, you can't really look at that person and say that because you don't know how it affected that person. You know, we're not made the same. But the one thing that you can do is you can truly come to God and say, hey, look. Look, Lord, I need help. See, I need help. See, I told you guys, I told you in this church that when me and my mother went through something, it was 15 years I did not speak to my mom. And we stayed 15 minutes apart. I didn't want nothing to do. I'm cool. I was saved. But I hadn't forgiven her. All right? But what I found out is when we did finally get, you know, the, 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 the Lord settled things, I lost 15 years that I could have spent with my mom. Okay? Now, was my mom changed? Any? No, she wasn't changed still. Just, you know, I mean, you still had her ways and everything. But I had matured enough that I didn't allow that to bother me anymore. What was important was I was able to be around her and truly love her. Okay? See, so you have to know that God wants you to forgive. You may not forget. You ain't stuck on stupid now. And neighbor done ran over your feet twice. You understand? I mean, well, you know, you done forgave him, but I ain't going to put my foot out there, you know, next week. Do you see what I'm saying? So you have to know that, that you're able to forgive. Why are you able to forgive? It's because God is able to strengthen you to forgive. But the thing of it is, you have to give it to God. You have to give it to God. You have, to, you have to be honest with him. That's why, that's why our prayer is important. Lord, I can't do this on my own. You know, Lord, every time I see them, I want to run them over. Lord, just, you know, you might have to pray to the Lord, let me see him when I ain't driving. You know, work, you know, be gentle with me, Lord. <laughs> you know, you, you see what I'm saying? Uh-huh. When it's not hate, but you still have, like, pain over it. Like, how do you know if you forgave him when you're still feeling hurt by it? Well, all right, that's a good question. The question was, if it's not hate, but it's hurt, okay? Now what you're dealing with is somebody that has damaged your emotions, all right? And normally when somebody has damaged your emotion, there is an amount of disrespect in there too. Then there is also an amount of rejection in there. See, there is a lot when, you, when you're dealing with that that you have compartment, you know, you, 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 you packaged up, okay? And what we do a great deal of the time is this. We'll act like it's okay because we don't want anybody to see that we hurt, all right? You know, we want to come out and still be tough, all right? You have to start talking to God about it and you need to get around mature people. I didn't say anybody. Mature people that you can talk about how you feel. Because see, a person that's going through that, you're not talking to anybody. You're holding that stuff in and the enemy knows you're holding that stuff in. So he could, he, 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 he could show you on something on TV. He could be a commercial with some popcorn that you and him used to eat. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, really. You have to understand that these are things that he uses. So this is where you have to start talking to people about it. But again, I say, make sure it's a, a, it's a mature person. Yeah. All right? And I, I mean, really, honestly, you need to find somebody that you can be really kicking with. Really just be open and honest with. A person that will not judge you. A person that will not, you know, just treat you like you know what, you're the scum of the earth. No. Remember Jesus said he came for those that were what? Sick. He didn't come from the well for the well. He said, I came for them that was messed up. I came for them that need me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So you got to start understanding that. That's why fellowship is so important. See, fellowship is important. It's no even if you go to, 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 to Starbucks and get a coffee and sit down and chop it up. You got to start because we have been trained. And I'm going to say it again. Those of us that's been in church for a while, we have been trained how to look like a real warrior. Yeah, I'm bleeding, but I, I'm still going to walk. I'm bleeding. 
Hey, shoot, I'm gonna tell you in a minute, I'm hurting. And that's where we, that's the way we start to help one another. As I close, I'm gonna share this with you. If two soldiers was un, in war together, and they've been fighting on the front line, and one gets shot, he's wounded. That other soldier will most likely grab him and carry him to safety. That's the way we should be with one another. Not to expose that person, but to cover that person. Amen? Amen. For those on Facebook, thank you. I'm Pastor Mel. I hope you enjoyed this message. I hope this message was very meaningful for you. God bless you. See you next Tuesday. I'm out. Man. Now, what questions may we have on this? Everybody got questions? You know what, Pastor, can I say something? Yes, ma'am. Forgiveness.